Oh, snap. Yeah, it's three o'clock. <laughs> All right, uh, streaming on my channel now. Sorry, I'm just posting this on the stream on social media. All right, give me one second. Just want to tweet this out. Oh man, I cannot handle coffee. I have the biggest fucking headache from a double espresso that I had when I was on stream with uh, someone else. Okay, streaming on my own channel now. <laughs> Tabernacle rising. <laughs> I'm always rising. That's what you should know about me. So I'm just gonna get the chat up on a separate tab so I can moderate it. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, sorry, wrong part. Let me set the live chat. All right, hey everyone. Um, hey Robin, hey San Fran fan. Uh, hello Tarbeck. Yeah, I'll just wait some more people. Hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, so basically, I want to talk about a couple of things today. The board up, the board yacht. Um, the board, the board yacht, the board ape yacht club is one thing I want to talk about. Um, but yeah, the Elon Musk thing. What article did I have up? One second, let me get my. Um, let's open this up. Yes, yeah, so apparently Republicans threatened Twitter to sell. Um, Hey, Lapis. I've been on Patreon for a couple of months. It's the first time I'm actually being around for a live stream. Yeah, Robin, thanks so much um, for become, for being a patron. Um, I can't always identify patrons because obviously patrons have different names sometimes. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you being one. One sec. Oh, I just want it hard to... Let me pop out the chat and move it over a bit. There we go. <laughs> Your Furby is watching it. <laughs> what color Furby is it? Um, yeah, the thing is, I like Twitter a lot. I'm actually pretty bummed about this news, to be honest. Um, because Elon, the problem with Elon Musk is like, so many rich people um, are involved on Twitter's board, but I think the problem is, is that he's so unhinged, like... I'm 100% sure he's going to start banning left-wing accounts. Like, that's just going to happen, for sure. Him saying that, like, he'll keep his critics around is such a bullshit. Like, you won't be able to post um, that Gilead Maxwell uh, thing anymore. The only social media I use is YouTube. That's fair enough. Um, I like social media a lot. Twitter, Reddit, Instagram. I use it all. <laughs> Um, they will start cancelling us well Republicans actually fucking do love cancel culture don't they like <laughs> they're not um, their whole war against cancel culture is just them being sad that they don't, people don't like conservative people reminder to like the stream yeah like the stream if you want to like the stream um well, Trump at the moment says he doesn't want to return to tr to Twitter, but um, I'll see how long that lasts. Um, yeah, it's just what's more, what's somewhat more annoying about Elon Musk buying Twitter is because uh, Twitter. Do you like the way I say that? Um, 
is that he has so many simps thinking it's a good thing. Oh yeah, the guy who personally union bust, the guy who's being sued right now for running a ra racially segregated workplace. Yeah, he's totally a champion of free speech. Can't wait to him to own um Musk, own Musk, own Twitter. If Kavanaugh cancels rancid Musk, Musk yeah. If Kavanaugh cancels rancid Musk, will that make Twitter officially vanish from existence? Uh, we'll have to see. You know, I cancelled Mr. Beast multiple times. His channel is still there. Maybe my my cancelling power is not as strong as it once was. Yeah, he bought he bought Twitter and he's gonna make it private as well. Like, it's a publicly traded company, I believe, at the moment. Twitter is owned by a South African, and what's this fucking shit? People are calling him an African American. He's not American. He's not he's not got American citizenship. He's fucking South African. <laughs> People are saying like I'm so happy in Africa like obviously conservatives are like I'm so happy an African American owns Twitter and it's like it, he's not fucking American. <laughs> so stop it. Hey Joe, thanks so much um for coming over from Jen's stream. Appreciate that. Um, I had a lot of fun on that, um, but then I, because uh, I'm probably gonna do three videos in a row this week, at, like make them. So I thought I might as well jump on stream for a bit. Um, <laughs> Lime Green Hunk, I think you would be banned quick, and they'd say it was for spam or something. Yeah, he did buy Twitter. Um, the the word limit it used to be smaller. To be honest, it's way bigger now. Yeah, for, for pres mine owning white South African. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like um, why? Why I don't understand why anyone thinks it's a good idea. Like, even if you like Elon Musk, does the richest person on earth running one of the most influential social media platforms? That's a good thing. Like one, like one guy buying that out. It's not even like a a company or a group of people. It's just one fucking guy. If Twitter gets flooded, with, well, it's already been fucking flooded with NFTs. Yeah, but Tim, he's he's offering the the at the price he's buying, they would all make so much fucking money. Thanks, Smith Black. Thanks so much for the two bucks. He's gonna run Twitter Instagram. Yeah. So my prediction is, I got two predictions. So one of them is, he's gonna run it like total trash and it's going to become such a poor platform that people will migrate to something else or he will actually realize that if you run it in the way he's saying like free speech absolutism bullshit that it will just descend into like a conservative not not only conservative but like the stuff conservatives will post on there will scare will like massively devalue the site, I think. So maybe he will actually just keep it similar. I'm not sure though. Cancel it on must, please. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. Oh, he actually is an American citizen. I didn't know that. But South, South Africans, don't call themselves African. I'm pretty sure they call themselves African. Guess it's like a it's like a different identity because it doesn't African imply like some sort of well not necessarily but I don't know the one group of white African people who are just descended from like Dutch and British settlers. Uh, Smith Black, uh, thanks for Nick. Thanks again for another donation. Uh, five bucks. Thanks so much. On the bright side, if he keeps running things as usual, conservatives will have to blame Elon instead of the left. But they will always find a way to blame the left for, for something to do with it. Like the left are pressuring him. The left have infiltrated Twitter, like the company. Nice haircut. Oh, thanks, uh, it 52 I've actually had it um, for quite a bit now. <laughs> but you probably haven't seen uh, any of the videos or streams. Yeah, um, I got it last Friday. I always just... Uh, shave my head when it gets too long. Um, yeah, but Mu yeah, Musk, ha Musk had an affair with Amber Heard, didn't he? Um, yeah, J JTVJ, I made a whole video about the Bored Ape Yacht Club being possibly some 4chan <laughs> Nazi thing. <laughs> They'll just say Elon is a leftist, yeah. Uh, 
Um, wait, why are we talking about AFS being evil? Oh, eight fifty-two. It's not a problem. Thank, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> I do miss my, miss my mohawk sometimes. I do like getting a mohawk. Yeah, Elon's called himself a socialist and he's like, oh yeah, Marx was a capitalist, read his book. <laughs> it's like the only thing, like Marx says, countries must go through like capitalism, industri capitalist industrialization to reach like socialism and communism. Doesn't mean he's actually a capitalist. Yeah, the thing is, Elon Musk is, at, like, worshipped by American conservatives now, right? And he's obviously, like, in aligned with them politically. He's not some sort of, like, centrist. Like, the thing is, at least with Jack Dorsey, as much of an idiot he, he is with believing in that Bitcoin ideology, is that at least you know he's actually a libertarian, where Elon Musk 100% is not a libertarian. But it's just, like... Everything, everything just sucks these days. Like, I don't, this this news is just depressing, especially for me because I like Twitter, and it's like, I know his biggest target is going to be his critics. Like, he literally is a t fucking teenage four channel who cannot handle being criticisms. He's an absolute man baby. Why is he got like, fifty fucking two and posts like like a teenage ed edge lord? It's so fucking ridiculous. I mean, libertarianism like capitalist libertarianism is stupid i think like socialist libertarianism like in a small kind of community aspect is not so bad <laughs> um yeah you had cryptocurrency to twitter yeah and you absolutely, <coughs> you absolutely know that it's just going to be some sort of like propaganda arm for his companies as well. But yeah, I'm not. I'm just like, I'm just like, we're talking about this on the the stream I was just on. I'm just such a doomer about everything. Everything is so crap at the moment. Um, so let's let's make ourselves laugh before we talk more about Elon Musk. So um, the board yacht, um, board. I keep calling it the board yacht. The Bored Ape Yacht Club, you guys might remember my video on, on this a while ago. Sorry, I'm talking quiet because I'm a bit conscious about how much noise I'm making. Let me just put my headphones in. I feel less less, <laughs> less conscious. So um, this is fucking funny. So let's, uh, let's go on to this. Oh, can we change the fucking... I cannot, I cannot look at white text on a black screen. Let me see if I can change this quick. Uh, it's a tiny bit better. All right, so breaking the official board at Yacht Club Instagram account has been hacked and millions worth of NFTs have been stolen. Uh, the Discord and Instagram accounts of Board Ape Yacht Club were hacked on Monday and the hackers deployed a fake mint link to followers to gain access to their wallets. The hackers lured the users with the fraudulent mint uh, claiming they could mint land in uh, its other side meta, whatever the fuck that means. The users who clicked on the link would have fallen, fallen prey to the attack. The wallets of these users have also been compromised as the hackers gain access to their wallets and transferred assets, including NFTs of different wallets. Crypto sleuth uh, Zach XBT drew out a map of the hacker's address and tweeted out the hack. An estimated 24 bored apes and 30 mutant apes have reportedly been stolen at the time of writing. The value of the stolen NFTs is around 13 million. <laughs> but as the reports um, from Zach, um, all right, so here's Gargamel, uh, one of the founders of the Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, the IG hack resulted in four apes, six mutants, three kernels, and some other assorted valuable NFTs being lost. We will be in contact with the users affected and we will post a full post mortem on the attack. Where we can, where we can, for now, I would like to stress that two-factor authentication is available. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of fun news. Um, buying a stupid monkey picture um, for hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases is probably not a secure investment, especially when it's backed up by like cryptocurrency, which isn't regulated, and there's no obviously security in that. So, like, it's not like a regulated stock exchange or anything like that. You're just fucked. 
and nothing of value was lost yep um so I'm afraid it's more stuff Yeah, so Robin, um, the Gargamel, he changed his name when some guy pointed out. So Gargamel is the bad guy in the Smurfs. Um, and I think some people on 4chan have used it as like a caric a racist caricature um, of Jewish people. Like I've seen Gargamel wearing like an Israeli... Uh, what's the hat Jewish people wear? Is it yarmulke? Um But yeah, so that's basically why he changed his name. Yeah, but in terms of just the the Twitter stuff, I was going to make a video on it, but I don't think I will because um, there's something else I want to talk about. But like Twitter, the, the Donald Trump ban being reversed doesn't really disturb me. It's just like... Now there's basically like no oversight for it to become a terrible platform. And it's annoying for someone like me who obviously is like talked to loads of people on Twitter, like follows loads of people I like um, and has built up like a minor following on Twitter, only like 7.7K followers. Uh, but it's taken fucking ages to do that. It's really hard to grow Twitter followers, um, especially when you post the shit I post on it. But then yeah, for that to be gone, it'd be really annoying. Like, and also like imagine if man if if elon musk bought youtube i would be panicking bad like it 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 just fucking sucks that um a handful of billionaires and corporations own all our social media like instagram facebook and whatsapp all owned by the same guy um snapchat didn't sell so then instagram just copied snapchat and then now twitter is owned by elon musk and i don't know who owns tiktok is it is tiktok a chinese company um and reddit is owned i don't even know who fucking owns reddit yeah i'd give up people on youtube yeah for sure darpa every time i see darpa i just think of the darpa chief um siget <laughs> signet signet or sigint from a uh, metal gear solid 3 and metal gear solid 1 who sold Twitter to Musk? Well, the board of Twitter, I guess. Yeah, I don't care about Donald Trump, though. Like, Twitter's got more insane since he left. Sigint, yeah, <laughs> from Metal Gear. Didn't Elon say he would cure world hunger? Yeah, so basically, Elon Musk said if the UN outlined how he could end world hunger, then he would do it. And I think they gave him... A plan that was about twenty billion dollars, and then he just didn't do it. <laughs> Meow Nian, thanks so much for the seven Canadian dollars. Your thoughts on Ukraine removing a video that equated Hirohito with Hitler and Mussolini? Uh, the LDP seems slightly about her about. Yeah, uh, that's funny. Um, so basically, for people who don't know, Ukraine were talking about like fascism, like a uh, the Ukrainian embassy, and they posted the video just talking about Japanese fascism. And the Japanese, um, a lot of the Japanese people got really butthurt that Hirohito was put in there. Um, I guess because Hirohito, thanks to the Americans, escaped blame for the war. Um, and they're basically trying to say Japan weren't as bad as the Nazis, when of course they were. Like, I, I don't know how you quantify who was the worst um, out of all of these. I mean, Italians probably least worst because their death toll was way smaller. Um, not saying, obviously completely horrible yeah so um the Euro ukraine shit at the moment is just so ridiculous like i can't even be bothered to talk about it because the nazi stuff in particular is insane because all right liberals are telling me that nazism isn't actually a problem in ukraine right so there are such a minority who cares really like a thousand fires uh, no parliamentary representation okay um, so if they're, su if they're not a big deal, why can the condition of billions of weapons, billions of dollars of weapons, can it not be, here you go Zelensky, here's your, here's your weapons, um, please get rid of that neo-Nazi faction of the National Guard, because we don't want to arm Nazis. But of course, 
Nate Owa bragging about Azov getting weapons and all this other shit. And then I saw in New York people chanting about Azov the other day. And it's like, here's the thing people need to remember, right? Golden Dawn, <clears throat> you guys might remember, about a year ago I made a video on them. Golden Dawn are Greek, are, or were Greek neo-Nazis. Um, what they were before they got elected was football hooligans who primarily just started fights at football games and they beat up Afghan and Pakistani refugees in Greece, right? That's all they did. And then because of the economic situation, austerity and the Greek bailout, they rose to become the third biggest party in the Greek parliament for about like four years, five years. So people telling me that, you know, doesn't matter giving Nazis loads of weapons, doesn't matter ignoring the problems with Ukrainian fascism historically and now, because if you say that you like Russia, and I've made it clear a million times at this point that I want Ukraine to push the Russians out. Um, but the thing is, it's just like Afghanistan in, in the 1980s, right? Like imagine Twitter discourse and then it's like, yeah, can we can we arm the Mujahideen who aren't like Islamic fundamentalists who, you know, want to wage this jihad war? And then people are like, oh no, you support the Soviets. Like how dare you say that? And it's like, why, why can't you just support the Ukrainian groups that aren't Nazis? It's like, and I talked about this on Gen, Gen, uh, Gen stream just before I came on. There seems to be like, and and let me know in the chat what you think about this, right? So I, I, I've concluded my theory about why American leftists can be so frustrating, right? Because a lot of American leftists were saying that Macron was actually the better option in the French election because the leftist candidate in France didn't like the European Union, right? And I think to a lot of American leftists, they still think that America, despite its problems, is actually the best superpower to be in charge. Like, if they had to choose China or Russia in their minds, not saying I would choose them either, but I'm saying they're like, this is why we choose America. And that means being pro-globalization. Because I think what a lot of all Americans think about, because they've benefited so much from globalization, is that globalization is always good. Like, and if you are, like... America first type shit, you're a fascist. And what they don't understand, I'm not saying I'm like this, but they don't understand that a lot of socialist movements in Europe don't like globalization because what it does is it moves their jobs to overseas and it results in easier exploitation and their jobs don't get replaced, right? So Margaret Thatcher uh, moved all British jobs to like Malaysia and, and other places for cheap as part of neoliberalism, right? So the left in Britain, the real socialist left, historically do not like the European Union. The Tony Blair left do like the European Union, right? As someone who voted to stay in the European Union, I think there are more benefits to that. But then for a lot of people, it can be xenophobic or it can be legit. Companies moving away across the European Union to poorer countries to exploit their workforce or to some people as well, European migrants coming here working for cheaper and stuff up to a lot of like hardcore leftists, socialists, they don't like institutions like the European Union because they believe it's like an easier way for corporations to go around and exploit people, right? And I'm not saying most people who voted to stay in the European, who voted to leave the European Union weren't mainly motivated by xenophobia because I still believe that because that's all the campaign was. It wasn't about jobs. It wasn't about uh, e e economics, really. It was just about xenophobia, about Turkey joining the EU and all this shit, right? So when they see someone in like in the French election, I forgot what his name is, but I saw they were all moaning that he was against the EU. And it's like, I would rather an anti-EU socialist president who makes French lives better than a pro-EU right-wing president who demonizes Muslims and actually panders to the far right for his treatment of Muslims and doesn't make anyone's world better, right? For example, I voted to stay in the European Union. I'm going to get an Irish passport so I can basically still be... I'm going to become an Irish citizen so I can basically still be a European Union citizen, right? I would take Jeremy Corbyn doing Brexit rather than the Tories staying in the EU. I always said that. I would always take that. I would rather this country get better and leave the European Union than stay in it and this country gets shit. And then I get the worst of both worlds where we leave the European Union and we're ruled by the Tories. But that's what a lot of people in this country, they, they wouldn't vote for Jeremy Corbyn, some of them on the left, because they he didn't like the European Union, right? And he's old school socialist. Loads of people don't like the European Union. Um, and it's just so frustrating. And, and I feel like even with that Chris Smalls stuff, when he went on Tucker Carlson or even people hating Chris Smalls, 
because the, the guy who who helped the Amazon Union, who was the spearhead of the Amazon unionization effort, even people like him, it's like because potentially he said something bad about AOC, he's a bad guy now to some people. And it's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? He could go around saying, fuck AOC, what has she ever done for us? I'd still like him for what he's done. And that's the main thing people need to... Just because you disagree with some things... But then I think with a lot of American leftists, they believe globalization is just always a positive thing. And they don't understand how European leftists historically do not like the American world order. And that includes globalization, NATO, European Union... European Union is, of course, nothing to do with America, but is influenced by America, right? So that's why it's just frustrating... Because I think a lot of American leftists, and again, I'm not talking about anyone specifically, I'm not even talking about anyone in the chat, but I'm saying I think American exceptionalism is so powerful that you cannot understand why people wouldn't automatically like the status quo from America and, and why you can't have countries keeping that status quo but also being left-wing. And you cannot understand why socialist people would be against NATO. Like, it's crazy that Jeremy Corbyn says he wants to disband NATO and loads of people turn on him. Like, the thing is, even if I disagree with him, which I ultimately don't disagree with him, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I care about him being a decent person who wants to make people's lives better and him working with unions, being anti-racist and all this stuff. I care about that. So it, it's this weird shit. Like, I like AOC, right? She, what is she actually... Like, I like AOC, I like the squad, but to be honest, electoral politics is so limiting... What have they achieved? Like, what have they achieved? Like, in terms of broad federal electoral politics, they've barely done fucking anything, right? Because they've been marginalized by Biden or they were in the opposition. They've done some good things for their local communities. I won't dispute that. But they haven't had a massive impact on most of the country. And that's the thing, like, that Chris Smalls, he might have a bigger impact than any of the squad because he's doing outside electoral politics. Like I said, he was nice to AOC in the end. He didn't take Tucker Carlson's bait. But even if he did... I wouldn't care. Like, genuinely would not give a shit if he said he hated all the squad and they're all, like, sellouts. I wouldn't care. Doesn't mean I agree with that statement. It just means he's done something more important. I'm not going to get my feelings hurt by him saying he doesn't like a politician I like. And that's just, like, generally why I find it so frustrating sometimes on the American left, just labelling everyone like tankies or all this shit. And it's, like, being a leftist in a different country means you you think about issues through like your country right the same way americans do but then there's a lot of american european leftists who think completely different like greece hate america greek communists hate america because of what america and britain did to greece after the war loads of european leftists hate america that is just a very common thing loads of asian leftists hate america japanese leftists korean leftists they hate america and and they do not see American imperialism as a good thing. They do not see the American status quo as a good thing. And it's it's not for these people. There isn't like, well, if it was America, Russia, or China, who would you pick? Most of them would say not America because America has been destructive to their countries, right? And I've always said I'd rather like bigger blocks of countries versus each other. So America, like North America and the UK, one European Union, another Russia, India, South Africa, Brazil, that's another, China, another, Gulf countries, another, Africa, another, like African Union or something. So it's just, um, yeah, annoying to deal with that stuff sometimes because like, you know, loads of Americans I really like, I really agree with, most of my audience is American, I've got no problem with them, but I find it frustrating sometimes when I talk about like proper politics people get really funny about it. Like when I was talking about Ukraine or Taiwan and other shit, like people get really reactionary about my, my perspective because they want me to think that for somehow like America, is, like I, I maintain this and, I, and I'm not going to change about this. If this makes you, if it makes you upset, right? We can talk who has a worse like domestic politics and which state is more authoritarian, but in terms of its effect on the world through economics, imperialism, the U.S. is still should be number one enemy for every leftist. The U.S. is the pioneer of this capitalist world order, piggybacked off the British, created this dystopian world we're living in today. Free market economics, IMF, imperialism in all these states. And I'm not saying 
America is guilty of it on its own. It's deeply in bed with Western countries like the UK and the European Union states as well. But if you are a leftist, there is no way I'm making the argument that China or even Russia has a worse impact on the world, like the world. Does Russia have a worse impact on Eastern Europe? A hundred percent. I understand why Eastern Europeans rot, like, like America and hate Russia. I understand that. Does China have a worse impact on the world? Well, if you asked someone in Tibet, you, they would say, well, China is the main enemy. If you ask someone in like disputed territories, I don't know, with, with other countries, they'd say China. But broadly, China does not have that reach that America does. Russia, 100%, nowhere even close, right? So if I'm, and, and the thing is as well, <clears throat> often things like Russia, you can trace, trace its own problems back to America because the IMF, World Bank, America, Britain, they backed, they backed Putin. They knew who Putin was and they backed him. So the, my problem for a lot of people is America is enemy number one. Like, and I'm not talking about Americans. I'm not talking about all American politicians. I'm talking about America as the state, the American appar like colonial apparatus, um, America that you know still takes uh, money off places like Laos and Cambodia, still is doing economic warfare against Cuba, like all this time later. That's the enemy for anti-capitalists, the main country that is holding up the capitalist system without trying to regulate it at all. Right, the the country that will like allow so much shit to go on it well okay america is in itself a dystopia obviously the american ruling class do not give a shit about americans anyway but it's like in terms of the world africa being the prime example for me it's like a country that is minerally rich like resource rich has like a lot of people there um has ancient history of like countries and nations and everything like that it's it stays like relatively poor because they want it to stay poor for exploitation. America, we talk about like Chinese, what's, what's the thing they keep saying, which turned out to be a myth, like something about like Chinese debt slavery in Africa. Are you, are you fucking kidding me? Even, even if, if China was doing this in some countries, America has been doing this since the fucking 70s. And we do not talk about it. Like this debt slavery America has done to so many African countries. And, and it's just so frustrating. It's like, like okay, I'm a, I'm a British person who's with an Irish background and stuff, I don't know, you know if, how valuable that makes my perspective. But at the same time, I just, I just like, e even with the NATO stuff, right, I, I can concede that, like, now, in 2022, having a defensive alliance against Russia for European states makes sense. Having that defensive alliance headed by the United States does not help anyone. If Russia can't conquer Ukraine, you think it's going to conquer um, most European states with France and the UK and Germany in it as well. You think that's going to happen? It's not going to happen. And they have the nuclear weapons to back it up, France and the UK. So that's my problem. It's like NATO, as an organization founded to undermine communist movements, help Nazis, um, and generally be super militaristic and do illegal wars in places like Libya and Afghanistan, um, I don't like them. And if I wanted a defense force against Russia, I would take out America because we don't need them and they're not European and they don't need defense against Russia. Where European states, if we're going to make the argument European states need defense against Russia because it is the number one like legit threat to a lot of these countries, even the UK, then that's that's one thing. NATO does not make sense in my opinion. And Turkey, like Turkey fucking are turning towards Russia and they're meant to be part of this alliance. <laughs> So I'm going to read some comments. Uh, I don't like using the word tanky because tanky was meant to mean Stalinist. Tanky does not mean Stalinist anymore. It means basically leftist who does not like US. It feels like it means leftist who thinks US is the worst state on earth. Like, is that what tanky means these days? Like, I'm someone... Okay, there are some weird fucking people. I saw people simping for Gaddafi the other day. I'm like, you're never going to get me on board with simping for the Gaddafi. The best thing Ka Gaddafi did was overthrow the Libyan monarchy. <laughs> He's still a tyrannical dictator, right? Gaddafi is so much more... Gaddafi is so different from like even Nasser, obviously his hero in Egypt. Um, I'm never... I'm never the thing is, I'm never going to tell you North Korea is an amazing place to live and it's achieved socialism. I'm never going to tell you Gaddafi was a good guy. I'm never going to pretend like... 
all these I know they're gonna pretend like Mao Zedong was the best guy ever, although I'm not hysterical about him. Um, I will tell you, for um, Che Guevara is 100% a better person than any US president, um, and Ho Chi Minh as well. But um, yeah, so so that's the thing. Like, I don't, but do I get called a tanky because I hate America? Like, is that what it is? Because like North Korea, I will treat with nuance and realize that both most things I know about North Korea, or like I've been taught about North Korea until I went to university and stuff, was basically fucking made up. Um, but I will also concede that North Korea is not a nice place to live. It is an authoritarian state. Um, it cannot sustain itself. There are famines there. There are people who corroborate this, like Russian people. Um, I'm not going to pretend North Korea is some bastion of socialism. I'm just not going to treat North Korean people like they're some sort of alien race who do not understand basic humanity because they've been brainwashed so bad because I know it's not true. Um, so, like, it's just frustrating because, like, there is an element on the left who think... Every every state that rejects American imperialism is good. Like even Russia. <laughs> like Russia is good because it rejects American imperialism, like or challenges American imperialism, right? That's why you get a lot of fucking weird leftists supporting Russia against Ukraine, right? And while I think the Ukrainian state is dog shit, corrupt, fascist in many ways, I think that about the Russian state as well. I still support the Ukrainian people's right to self defense. And that's the difference, right? So even though I know Ukraine are in bed with the American government, I also know their number one threat is from Russia. I'm not a fucking idiot. North Korea, I'm like I said, I'm not going to pretend they're good because they reject US imperialism. The same with Iran, right? The thing is, what I feel about these countries, I don't like the domestic governments, but I also recognize how those governments are often a result of US war and US imperialism. And I will say it's just hypocritical to exclude countries like Iran from the global economy and exclude it um, from just being an open country because of its government, when we also ally ourselves and defend Saudi Arabia and Israel. So that's how I can't understand, like, if we're going to have this basic set of morals in the world, well, at least enforce it on Israel and Saudi Arabia, like ostracize them from the global community like you do for Iran and Russia. Well, you're not doing that. So let's not ostracize them. Let's, let's take them back in. Like, what, what have Iranians, what have Iranians in the last 20 years done to, like, your average American, right? Maybe some conflicts with American soldiers, like through proxies and stuff like that. Not too much. What have North Korea done to Americans? You know, killed that guy, that one civilian. Okay, that's bad. But over the course of the history, who's done more to who? America has done more to North Korea. The same with Vietnam. Like, had embargo until the 1990s, right? What had, what had Vietnam, like, unjustifiably done to America? Would defend their country from American brutal genocides and imperialism cuba what have cuba done to america like literally what have cuba done to america nothing like cubans have literally done nothing to america and it was a u.s colony in all but name for like fucking 50 years um and you excluded them from the international community properly because what they're communist because they rejected u.s imperialism they kicked out all the racist as fuck fascist um, plantation owners so it's just like you know the double standard and everything it's just it's just really really frustrating and it's like that's what i mean um you can walk this fine line in left-wing politics where you see the u.s as the number one enemy but you don't think every challenger to u.s imperialism is good but you accept there is massive hypocrisy in the world where israel and saudi arabia are key players in the global economy while cuba and iran are ostracized despite cuba and iran Iran is not worse than Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is worse than Iran. Cuba is far more moral and a better country than Israel. Except if we're going to accept those two, accept Cuba and Iran. It's not hard. And even when I was younger, I remember um, in Britain, they used to talk about Venezuela. They, this shows socialism can work. You take oil profits and you pump it into social programs, right? Literally, I am not joking. I used to be taught in geography class in probably 2010, 11 that Venezuela showed socialism working. I am not joking about that. I remember that very, very clearly because I've never had a negative opinion of Venezuela until some stuff about Maduro. And of course, I don't agree with Maduro. I don't agree with his government. I think generally states like that, even if they have some redeeming features, Maduro especially, him and the army basically use the economy for their own benefit, especially the Venezuelan army. It's it's Venezuela's... The, the corruption in Venezuela reminds me a lot of Egypt and it reminds me a lot of um, Iran as well, where the military 
are in essence an economic power. So I'm not going to pretend Venezuela is great. I'm also not going to pretend um, Venezuela has done anything wrong to the American people because it hasn't. America doesn't. Venezuela doesn't deserve its treatment. It's an insanely poor country. Um, so I don't think it should be sanctioned because what? It's authoritarian, according to the US, who probably killed and brutalized more anti-government protesters in 2020 than Venezuela has done like in 2020 as well. Let's read some more things. And I think for a lot of people, it it's hard it's hard to get on board um it's hard to get on board with ukraine in a very zealous way because it just feels a bit like you're you're treating you're simply treating the issue without nuance because it's clear who the bad guy is right it and, and this is the my problem with ukraine i'm not saying ukraine is similar to saddam hussein's iraq but it's like it's like someone's reaction to America invading um, Iraq being that Saddam Hussein was a good dude, right? That's the sort of thing they're doing with, well, by whitewashing the Nazis in Ukraine. It's like, I would say I support Iraq's right to defend itself from US imperialism. I do not support Saddam Hussein's government. And the problem being in Iraq, well, if you're trying to say something like that was a moral action by the US to, to kill a brutal dictator, then why didn't the Americans leave? They didn't leave. And that's why people forget the Iraqi insurgency was not just Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda exploited it. The original Iraqi insurgency was multiple groups from multiple different communities and ethnicities and religion rising up because they wanted the Americans gone. That was not Al-Qaeda who started that. That was ordinary Iraqi people who started that. Um, and obviously, Iraq was primarily done for oil. And then in the hypocrisy, of course, Saddam Hussein was backed by the West until like no, 1989, given weapons to fight Iran. So it's just, um, you know, Russia is the obvious aggressor. Yeah, of course it is. Um, Ukraine is a somewhat corrupt neoliberal state. Russia is for, yeah. I mean, I'm never, I'm never going to defend Russia. I've, I've said consistently, I'm afraid the UK is going to become Russia in 30 years, like this oligarch um, run sham democracy. Uh, I'm just not, as someone who knew a bit about Ukraine before the war, unlike some people uh, i'm just not going to pretend Zelensky is the best dude ever and i love the ukrainian state right i ukrainian people i support i support their right to defend themselves that's it i don't give a shit about Zelensky. he's brave for staying behind not every politician would do that so respect for that don't like his politics don't like the 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 you know the capitalist ukrainian state uh, but yeah, Ukrainians having their homes destroyed, totally support their right to defend themselves, do not support arming Nazis to do that. And like I said, if liberals are telling me, which they constantly tell me, Nazis aren't a problem in Ukraine, you're overblown the issue, then please let's make a condition of aid to Ukraine that they arrest that Nazi battalion. A thousand soldiers? Who really gives a shit? I've probably less now because a lot of them have been killed. So just arrest them, break it up. But again, this is this is the short-sightedness Golden Dawn became an electoral force off the back of economic uh, disaster. I can predict that if, especially, even if Russia do annex eastern Ukraine, I 100% bet a fascist party, openly fascist, is going to become a major political force in Ukraine in the next 10 years. That is just going to fucking happen because what's happening is you see a lot of fascist soldiers, not just as of, and they're going to be seen as heroes of Ukraine just because I've made videos on this. A lot of the veterans of the Second World War who sided with the Nazis are honoured in Ukraine. This was a law passed in 2008 to give them the same status as actual Ukrainian like veterans of the war, I think. Like the ones who actually fought the Nazis for the Soviets. Ones who fought with the Nazis to genocide Polish people, um, Romani people and Jewish people. So to understand Ukrainian fascism, you have to understand that you, some Ukrainians will tolerate fascism because these fascists fought the Soviets and the Russians. That is why they tolerate it. Not because they're all like zealots for the Nazis, it's because they see the Russia as their biggest enemy, so they like the Nazis who stand up to them. And that's the problem with the acceptance of Nazism in Ukraine, which people don't seem to get. They seem to think like the only part of Nazism that is apparent in Ukraine is Azov, when that's just not true. 
you see ordinary Ukrainian soldiers having black sons and, and SS skulls and stuff. I've seen this. And, and the meme on Twitter at the moment is, why does every time a Western press um, photographer take a picture of a Ukrainian soldier, they have some sort of Nazi badge on them? Because it's becoming so common. Um, so that's what people need to understand. But then again, doesn't mean I don't support Ukraine's right to you know, defend itself. I want Ukraine to not become like a colony of Russia. I want Ukrainians to make up their own mind about their future. I'm just very, very hesitant to whitewash like the protesters in New York were doing yesterday or fund literal Nazis the same way that they didn't in Afghanistan realize that funding Islamic fundamentalists with billions of dollars in high-tech weaponry and helping them network around the world had, was an absolute disaster for, to the US. Like even to US civilians is killed in 9-11 and, and the World Trade Center bombing in, in the 90s and stuff. So... Is there not a way to just arm people who aren't fanatical fascists? Can, like Joe Biden, can you given all this aid away? Can you not call up Zelensky and say, you will not get this until the fascists don't get it? But when have the American government ever cared about arming fascists? Probably not. The US will take a fascist over a communist every day of the week. And it's been that way since 1945. I'm just reading some comments. Yeah, Americans armed a lot of fascists, Korea, Vietnam, yep, Taiwan. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, all these things are just frustrating to talk about with Americans sometimes because it's like, if you are against thing, that means you support other thing. When that's not like, for example, when you I even try and voice these things about Ukraine, it's like, well, if you don't support Ukrainian government, you are apologists for Russia. And it's like, no, like as a leftist, I don't think we should be simping for any nation state. I just support people, Ukrainian people. And I always say this, Taiwanese people, decide what you want to do. Ukrainian people, decide what you want to do. If you don't want to be part of Russia, which most of them don't, then I totally support that, right? Taiwan, if you don't want to be a part of China because you formed your like, own national identity, all this other shit, I, yeah, I, don't, I support you choosing your right to what you want. And it's clear with Taiwanese politics at the moment, they've moved away from even considering themselves Chinese. They consider themselves Taiwanese, a lot of them now where the nationalists always consider themselves the true rulers of China, Taiwanese people now are split on that, even though it's in the Taiwanese constitution. My main issue with both of these is I never wanted America to fight a war against superpowers for them. Like I always said, and the thing is, this this take got me like loads of shit from, from like more lib leftist Americans. I said, if Taiwan got invaded by China, I wouldn't want America to get involved because I don't want World War Three. The same thing that Joe, the exact same thing that Joe Biden said about Ukraine, right? He said, I'm not going to get America involved because I don't want World War Three. But apparently when it comes to Taiwan, that's insane. Like, how could I not want America to go to war with China? And, and it's just, the thing is, the world is not is not a black and white place and it's not a moral place. So you cannot have it all, geopolitics, like obviously I have a master's degree in international relations and stuff. Like I've learned about this loads. Geopolitics is messy, right? Taiwan is such a messy issue because Taiwan was a Japanese colony since 1895, given back to the Chinese by the Japanese after the war, but it was Chiang Kai-shek's government they go back to. Communists win the civil war. Chiang Kai-shek flees to set up his own government on Taiwan, and then he's backed by America, otherwise the Chinese communists would invade. Like, the only reason Taiwan even exists as a state is because of Western macking of Chiang Kai-shek, this fascist who killed most native people in Taiwan, can I remind people as well, him and his son, and killed most communist people. Actually, Chiang Kai-shek did genocides against communist people. This is America's ally, right? And if the balance of power changes, and now China, because they want to, can invade um, Taiwan, then it's just like sometimes, in a really like morbid way, 
that's just an inevitable reaction of the shift in geopolitics. If America declines, China rises, then sadly, which sucks for the Taiwanese people, they get caught in the middle. And what I'm hoping is through negotiations, Taiwan will never be invaded and they'll never be part of a China, China unless they want to be part of China again. But that's, prob that's the problem, isn't it? Because China is becoming strong, America is weakening, and then you have a situation and it's just this historical backlash. What, what can we do about that? Like, you know, you Americans allowed Chiang Kai-shek to run riot on Taiwan, kill all these people, didn't have a problem with that. And now Chinese nationalism is rising because the Communist Party have been like whipping it up since the 1980s. Well, they didn't used to talk about it before then. And then it's just a shitty thing. It's like, and then you you have this reaction and then people want America to go to war with China over Taiwan. Like, are you insane? And that, that's just the, that's just the annoying thing about all of this. It's like, we should always want diplomacy, but sometimes with the tides of history, diplomacy just doesn't work. Like, look, look at Ukraine right now. Like, it's the tides of history. Putin has wanted to do this for a long time. He does it. You, you couldn't stop him from doing it, right? In a lot of ways, because he's Russian nationalist. I know we have the NATO thing and NATO being an aggressor, but at the same time, Ukraine was fully invaded, not just the eastern Ukraine because of Putin, not because of NATO. And like that's why people also think I'm a tanky for some reason, because... Um, they think I just blame NATO and I don't, but I recognize NATO's role in, in like, you know, Joe Biden used to say NATO shouldn't have more countries in it. He said this in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union because it's provocative, something I agree with, but you can't deny that the invasion of Russia is because of Putin and his nationalism. Um, but then that's a shitty thing. And sometimes, not to be a massive doomer about it, Americans, you can't solve all the world's problems. And, and, and if, if the solution to the problem is, I will go to full scale war with the other biggest superpowers in the world to solve these problems. You're not solving the problem because what I think a lot of people need to sometimes being more cynical and not being idealistic is a good thing because you have to choose the least shit option, right? So the least shit option in Ukraine is arming Ukraine to fight Russia. But for a lot of people saying close the sky, no fly zone, they want America to literally shoot down Russian planes. And that is fucking insane. Um, some people want that because they live in this this crazy world where the best solution to a problem is America getting involved because we all know that works out very well. Um, and that's the same with Taiwan, right? I, and I'm sure if Taiwan gets invaded in my lifetime, it's going to be Ukraine repeated. People will be like, why? Why don't you fight China? Why don't you shoot? Why don't you destroy their boats coming over to Taiwan? America, why don't you bomb them right now? Because I guarantee America is not going to do that. If someone like Joe Biden is president, if this ever happens, America will do the same thing they do in Ukraine. They'll arm Taiwan more, which they're already doing, and they'll let and they'll back Taiwan, and and Taiwan will fight, and you know they'll fight like hard, and you know, who knows what will happen? Maybe it'll be like Ukraine where they'll surprise the world, and um, Taiwan will repel an invasion. They have got a decent military, although it's way smaller than China. But the, my solution to that problem wouldn't be America attack now, and also it's even worse in that region because you have Korea and you have two Koreas that, are, you know, North, like that's the thing with China because of US, poli and that, that, I'm talking about like, as someone who has a history degree as well, it's historical currents, right? North Korea exists as this pariah state because of what the US did to them in, well, in the Korean war, right? They didn't, they didn't just stop the invasion of South Korea. They invaded the whole of North Korea, killed a third of its population. The only reason North Korea didn't become part of South Korea is because China stopped them, right? And and to a lot of people, that's that and, and that's the problem. It's like once you do that, North Korea are not gonna like you. North Korea are gonna be in bed with China. And then if you try and threaten China, then they'll be like, Well, how do you like North Korea then? Do you want North Korea with a massive military to invade the South, maybe attack Japan? And that's the thing, that region is such a fucking powder keg. Um India, Pakistan, who both have different allegiances now, because India doesn't like China, Pakistan likes China. So would you really want to open that tinderbox over Taiwan? And that, that's the thing people can't understand. It's shitty. I'm not denying it. Like with Ukraine, right? People are suffering because they haven't been able to defend themselves properly in certain regions. The answer isn't to try and start World War Three over that. That will not, because even though that may in the short term help that one person or that family who were killed or a civilians who were killed, it's not going to help the world. It's going to make it worse for the entire world. And sometimes when you're playing with massive like chess pieces of nuclear armed superpowers, you can't be saying like, like idiots saying like no fly zone over Ukraine. It's not fucking Libya. 
It's not Iraq. It's not countries that can't compare to you. It's a fucking nuclear armed power with like a proper air force, navy, and military. Same with China. You cannot enforce no fly zones on countries that you can go toe to toe with your military. And it's just like, like I said, with international relations, you sometimes have to take the emotion out of it, and it sucks because you know I'm someone who obviously is not in that position. An Eastern European or a Taiwanese person would say they want America to defend them, right? And of course they would. It, it, it would protect their country from imperialism, whether that be Chinese or Russian. But at the same time, because of their emotional attachment to that place, the community and everything, and of course I understand it, they don't understand how that will actually make the problem way worse for most people in the world, right? And you just got to choose what is, what is, what is worse, what is worse, what full on war between America and a superpower or another superpower doing something really shit. And as we see with Russia, obviously they have the power to cripple these economies if they want to. Um, I would be very interested to see what would happen if China invaded Taiwan next year or something. They wouldn't. Um, and the international community's reaction, because as we've even seen with the difference between America and France and how they've and Germany and how they have approached Putin, it's different, right? But China is in bed with way more countries economically, like loads of African countries, even at European countries that do a lot of business with China. What would happen? Like, would they commit to loads of sanctions against China? That's something that's that's interesting as well. So yeah, like it, my my general ideology which I know pisses people off, is I support self-determination. I support people's right to defend themselves. But sadly, when it comes to countries like China and the US battling over a territory, I do not support a country like the US. Like I said, I obviously do not support Russia invading Ukraine or China invading Taiwan. I don't want that. Like I don't know how clear I have to make that to people sometimes. What I also do not want I don't want America coming in and having a war with the other nuclear power. And that's just the same reaction, isn't it? Like, and, and here, here's the thing, like I've been, I think the Taiwan stuff has been something I've seen myself being like canceled over before, but it's like, imagine if the Soviet Union said, America, if you attack North Vietnam with bombs, I'm going to, I'm, we're coming into North Vietnam and we're fighting you. And I don't give a shit. Like, can, and even like, um, there's so many different examples that like Vietnam is a good example. It's like, imagine if uh, Russia were like, going in there or china were going in there like yeah we will fight you americans i mean chinese did do it covertly um and russians did have some advisors there um and some north koreans fought covertly as well but at the same time it's like an insane reaction because you know the ussr and china th the reason they supported the north vietnam in a way that it's very similar to how the us is supporting ukraine is because the soviet union and china didn't want world war three with the united states right so it's good in that instance. People will accept, well, that's a good thing. I'm glad I'm glad the USSR didn't roll in their army into Vietnam to protect Vietnam from America. I'm glad that China didn't send Chinese guerrilla fighters to go kill people in South Vietnam. I'm glad about that because we averted nuclear war. So how come it's different now? How come it's different when they're the aggressor? When America's the aggressor, we can all agree it's good the other superpowers didn't get involved. But when America isn't the aggressor, people clamor for America to get involved. Like, I don't understand the logic. You understand how America, Vietnam could have turned into a, a nuclear conflict. You understand how Afghanistan could have turned into a nuclear conflict if the American army went into Afghanistan in the 1980s to fight the Soviets, yeah? People understand that. But when, like, you know, and it, the Afghanistan is a good example because it's like Ukraine. So you understand that the US funded the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets and they backed them because it's their geopolitical interests. Um, but somehow you can't understand why someone wouldn't want that um, America to go to war with Russia over Ukraine or China over Taiwan. It, it's just ridiculous. Like, I don't understand what's wrong with people. And, and like I said, it, it must be like this idealism that you can solve everything with a, American military power, like they're the world police. But we all know Americans never do this for reasons that are, you know, goodness or morals. And then it often just makes the world shittier. And in these instances could result in full scale war in the really volatile regions of the world. So well, yeah, China and Russia were feuding over Vietnam at that time too. Yeah, for sure. Like um, Vietnam preferred the Russians during the war because Mao was being annoying um, and not supplying them enough aid. Can read some comments now. America isn't sending people into mass graves like Russia and China. I mean. Chinese mass graves. I don't know what you're talking about there. Um, yeah, Russia. Yeah, Russia, Russia are doing war crimes. The way Russians fight wars don't even pretend to care about civilians. I know this, right? Um, 
hoaxer. You know, the US literally did genocide in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And literally, the way they fought the war, they would call in airstrikes after being shot at once onto a whole village. That's how they fought the war. People in Vietnam are still poisoned by Agent Orange, like their children, form of deformities. Type in, type in babies with Agent Orange if you want to go to an indicator. America's response to that was slap Vietnam with sanctions, and Laos is still under sanction today. And that's the thing with, with America. It, it not only destroys your country, it cripples you economically as well. And um, yeah, Russia is bad. Russia is bad. China does bad things too. America is still my number one enemy. But, you know, if Russia was in America's position, would Russia be as bad as the United States? They would 100% be just as bad as the United States, possibly even worse, because they don't even have to pretend to care about morals because it's not a democracy like America where people might be accountable for things. So I understand that. But the thing is, what, what my point always is, it's not that Russia is better than the United States. Russia just doesn't have the reach to be as bad as the United States. So Russia literally, you know, is a, domestically, I can admit, Russia is a worse country than the United States. Like, I admit that. I do not, I do not admit that the Russia has a worse impact on the world than the United States. But at the same time, given a bit of nuance, like I said, I can also fully admit that Russia would, at the very least, be just as bad as the US, if not worse. So, is that a good answer? Okay, people are fighting the chat, so I'm not reading some of these out. Yeah, more bombs were dropped than Laos by the US and the total amount of munitions spent by all countries in World War II. So many bombs at the crater are still visible from outer space. Yeah, Rinsler sums it up very, very nicely. And the US response to that is to not apologize. Um, it's to sanction these countries and kill more people for economic warfare. Isn't that nice? Yeah, LD, that's true. Does being a super well, the thing is, America has always been ruthless. It's a genocidal. It's built. It's its whole country is built on genocide, imperialism, and slavery. Right? It's always had that um, ruthless streak. But yeah, could could uh, it's it's interesting. Like, could the could the the promise of power make a country that maybe doesn't have as bad a history become that way to become the superpower? I mean, that's something I couldn't use a good example because I can't think of too many countries that have okay histories. I don't know. Okay, I don't. I guess you guys aren't speaking to me. Tag, tag each other in the chat so I kind of know what you, who you guys are speaking to. Yes, yeah, so I caught fire. Said uh, the issue is people will label this appeasement. Yeah, people have said that to me, just like Hitler, and I, I people were mad at me because I said Putin isn't like Hitler, and it's like, and I said that I said the framing of Putin like Hitler is to try and push push people into war, um, because I like I said I wrote my master's thesis on media framing in the first Gulf War. Who did they compare Saddam Hussein to? Hitler, and they said if they let Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait, then he would be the next Hitler. And you would be the next Neville Chamberlain, George Bush, if you didn't fight him. And of course, what Saddam Hussein did was bad. Most people supported the Gulf War against Saddam Hussein. But at the end of the day, framing him like Hitler makes him seem like an existential threat that once he starts, is going to be very hard to stop. Same with Putin. Putin is a really bad guy. Russia is like 
horrible dystopian capitalist um, state, right? I'm not going to say he's Hitler because I'm not going to minimize that Hitler basically fucking killed 50 million people, including a mechanical genocide of um, millions of uh, Jews, disabled people, Romani people, gay people, and obviously communists as well. But that framing is meant to manipulate you. Like if you said, I don't know, Hitler's like, Putin's like Stalin, that probably makes more sense. Um, did I publish my master's thesis? The only reason I haven't published it is because I don't want to, I don't want to make my name really public. I know a couple of people know it, but um, generally don't tell people my name. So maybe one day when I'm more comfortable. Yeah, but Viva Dragon is was the British war in the Boer War? Is that Hitler? Was uh, the American war in Vietnam? Is that Hitler? They put Vietnamese in the concentration camps there. S search up strategic Hamlet program. Like I wouldn't say the American war in Vietnam made Lyndon Johnson like Hitler, even though it's obviously terrible. I don't understand the overuse of the Hitler framing. I think it's stupid. You don't need to. I mean, it, I mean, it is a bit public if you want to find it. Um, I don't really give a shit, but I just don't make it really popular. <laughs> Name review of 300. I mean, I used to talk about it, to be honest, but I just don't anymore. Here in the US, we have concentration camps on the southern border. Yeah, forced hysterectomies, yeah. I mean, America is literally the blueprint for Nazi Germany. And that's not even an exaggeration. <laughs> if we want to actually compare things to Hitler, um, um, Nazi judges and lawyers went to America to learn about race law. Hitler liked Manifest Destiny so much he wanted to do it in Eastern Europe. Um, like America and South Africa and all these shit, th shitty things inspired the Nazis, so... And obviously America still has a form of slavery and treats its native populations like absolute garbage. So I don't know how much shit for an hour. Give me one second. Yeah, that, that Bell and Panada video is good, actually. Uh, yeah, Town 2, yeah, not so bad. Uh, I just bit the press about Twitter. Not like really, but just making it... I, I think Twitter's fine as it is. It doesn't need to get really shitty by Elon Musk owning it. Um, but yeah. So Superluigi and Daisy saying, uh, okay, I have one thing to consider. Is that the USA being simply a former settler colony who directly inherited... Off advantage of how uh, did you finish your point, Luigi? Um, or is that the end of your point? Oh, hey, Olivia, <laughs> yeah. Um, I wouldn't delete my Twitter ever, but Elon Musk might delete it for me. <laughs> Yeah, Isabel, I, I agree. The money for the Twitter deal could have done so much good. I think that's what upsets me the most. Yeah, for sure. Mian, uh, will you ever do an episode of fascism, totalitarianism, and organized crime? Um, I guess I can't really think of something specifically to fit in that theme. Um, I guess I'll be open to it. Tomorrow's video, I'm going to be talking about female body standards and muscles because people are going mad about female Natalie Portman 4 with her swole shoulders. Um, so I want to talk about that in the context of Abby from The Last of Us and that 
strong, musty woman from that Pixar Encanto movie. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna do that tomorrow. I was gonna do that Elon Musk stuff. I just don't think it's gonna be relevant tomorrow. Really, it's just one of those news stories. Bring up Gina Carano. I mean, that's the one who gets a pass, isn't it? Because she's conservative. They don't mind her being absolutely fucking jacked. Do I like Muscle Mummies? Camp? Yeah, it's weird, actually. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. I've, I've never really been attracted to muscly women, but I think the representation in media has made me find women with more, like, broader bodies and more muscly, more attractive, I guess. Um... Like Abby from The Last of Us is attractive in a weird way. Like she's got kind of harsh features, like facially. Obviously, Laura Bailey's good looking, but like um, Abby as a character model, I don't know. I think she's good looking enough. Um, who else? Yeah, just maybe a bit of muscle. But I like people who have hobbies and like are into athletics. Um, so I like it being like a visible sign someone likes those things I guess <laughs> I've caught fire I spoke about Brie Larson and NFTs so <laughs> I don't think I need to talk about uh... oh okay Luigi sorry I just didn't think you finished your point Cav list his waifus I mean trying to think like obviously i think two celebrity people who i find really attractive is vanessa hudgens and you know and aoc probably like i don't know if that's weird like two women i do find like really really attractive um other than that like i'm not really fussy but i don't really simp for anyone like I, i'm not someone who would be like have really really unrealistically high standards about if someone's good looking i guess i don't find anyone like oh my god, like, best looking woman ever, or some shit like that. AOC is really good looking. And I don't know, I don't think that's really disputed any either. <laughs> yeah, I've got for I did, I fancied her bad when I was a kid. <laughs> but she's still really attractive st still. How do we get to this topic? Oh, because I was speaking about my video tomorrow. It's going to be about, like, why women with muscles always um always freak out nerds like makes them really mad i think it's just like a, a fragile masculinity thing what you see you see a woman who could obviously fuck you up um like abby from the last verse could i don't know many people who are gonna beat her in a fight or like um now now i think it's also like a weird like sexualization thing where like natalie portman is obviously like a really attractive woman um, but if she has muscles that are seen as like more masculine, then your like sex object is like less attractive to you. I think that plays a role as well. Um, well, I think she looks good with with her with her, her like new physique. I think it looks good. <laughs> DMB that might be true. Yeah, Bikini Atoll, um, I have looked into it because it's part of the plot of Metal Gear Solid because um, Big Boss was exposed to it when he was younger. Ashikar, yeah, Ashikar's good looking. I find her a little cringe though. Yeah, Vanessa Argent is hotter than AOC. If I had to date one, I'd obviously pick AOC because Vanessa Hudgens is a bit just because of that COVID thing it makes me think like she probably wouldn't, I don't know, wouldn't get on with me the best. <laughs> Raxim, Emma Watson is like, I think objectively hot. Daisy Ridley is okay. Like obviously, like that's what I'm saying. Like Daisy Ridley and Kristen Stewart, they're like good looking. I just don't find them that attractive. So I'm just reading some more things. It's horny, it's horny hours, boys. 
<laughs> yeah, Scott Johansson is hot, but I, I don't see the obsession, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but I'm on top. I also support Brentford. I went to the Brentford Spurs game the other day. Yeah, Pete Davison. Pete Davison just must have like not saying I don't think he's ugly, but he just must have like a he just must be absolutely hilarious. I think that he gets all these like stunning women. I don't, although I don't think Kim Kardashian's that good looking. His other girlfriends have been. <laughs> the thing is, I'm not mean. I'm not going to say anyone's ugly or anything. Um, I'm not like I'm not like some like jock who's going to treat women like shit. Um, I just have my preferences, I guess. Yeah, he dated Ariana Grande. He dated someone else as well. Um, Kate Beckinsale, I think he dated weirdly. Um, yeah, he's han he's handsome, but like he's not like I guess the stereotypical handsome. He's not stereotypically handsome enough that you would think he could date so much so many like very attractive women i guess he must have a mess of personality well i mean you can say that but like i don't think all these women just love him because of that because how easy is that to come by if you're like a really attractive female celebrity I, it just must be really funny i think To be honest, I think there's a lot more ugly guys who are going out with really good looking women than the other day, way around, it feels like. Which is weird in terms of like high profile, which is weird because I feel like guys are way less fussy in my experience. Um, guys have a lot lower standards. Slam culture is bourgeois cringe. I mean, you just can't help but follow it because it's just in your face all the time, I guess, is the main thing. Yeah, men roll things around how she... They do, but I do think men still don't have... like A lot of men don't have really high standards. Not that they should, but I'm saying, like, I think maybe it's a bit of a stereotype taken out of proportion although it is true in many ways i think i think men have a massive problem with sexualizing women to a crazy degree and having really high standards for like prominent celebrity women i think on like a relationship level i don't think men are as fussy as i made as i made out to be and i think women uh in my experience of talking to some of my friends who are girls um i think sometimes they can be like a bit more shallow not saying they are generally shallow a bit more shallow than we think i think there's like a i think it's exaggerated on on both sides i think but of course it's like my anecdotal experience like if if we had a survey that every person on earth it, it could be completely different Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio's girlfriend stuff is kind of gross, to be honest. But also, as you as you get older, and even I feel that. Not saying, not saying there's anything wrong with my girlfriend's looks, but as you get older, you realize that long term relationships, um, it's all it's all based on compatibility. It's not even so much having stuff in common like as i've gotten older i've, I've only been going out with my own girlfriend for like 10 years now um so we've gone from being 17 to like 26 um and you just w what makes you last that long from changing from being teenagers um to like older older 20s like i guess is uh compatibility like we recently lived together in spain in a, in a one room studio apartment right both working from home as well and we didn't fight like once we didn't have any problems but then i asked some people when i got back i was like about them and their girlfriend i was like would you <coughs> i was like would you get could you live three months in the same room basically and most of them were like no way and it, and i'm not saying that's a problem because you probably won't have to do that i'm saying what it made me realize is that we're just really really compatible even in that way as well, which just like when you're getting older, you realize that you're more and more compatible in most ways, which is really good. Um, 
but I think for a lot of relationships, especially if you prioritize, prioritize looks as well, like as the be all and end all, you might lose that. And then I said to my girlfriend, I always say this, I said, if we broke up, I'm not dating anyone because my standards, not for looks, my standards for compatibility are really high because it's like, I've had an experience now of being in a relationship where it is like really easy um, to be myself and relatively do what I want. And then if I had a girlfriend who, not saying this is wrong, was super demanding, but like always wanted to go out all the time, like go to restaurants, go to bars or just, or just go out anywhere, like all the time or wanted to see me loads and loads and loads. And I'd be like, I, I don't want that. Um, so I guess when you're, when you're younger, you, pro you focus on the looks, of course. That's how you get attracted to someone. But when you get older, especially, like I would be insanely picky and I probably would be so much more picky of someone's personality and long-term compatibility than anything to do with their looks. Um, because how are, you meant to, how are you meant to go out with someone for like years and years or maybe your whole life if you just don't get on well? And, and, it's, and it's nothing to do, like me and my girlfriend, like I love video games, I'm obsessed with politics. Uh, she likes her politics and stuff, but not as much as me, like I love my history, like into such a more like extreme way than she does, but she likes things I don't really care about, like Irish dancing, she's like massive into and does um, traveling, she loves. And although with the traveling stuff, I'm happy to compromise and go live in another country. I don't want to do like backpacking and stuff. Like I say, I'm, I'm not doing that. And then the compromise is we just go, I'm going to live in Vietnam, hopefully in September for like four months. But that's my that's my compromise basically. Um, so that's like a good thing in relationships where like looks obviously fade over time uh, anyway. But I think yeah, I think it's a bit. But that's why you guys in the chat can tell me this. This is why um, this is why I find Tinder, Bumble, Hinge. I find it so dystopian because it's like I, I, my girlfriend was telling me about one of her friends who had like five guys lined up on Tinder and. Or she talked to five guys, or maybe it was Hinge, and she would just message like a couple of them for like a booty call, and then some would say no, and some would say yes, and then she'd say no to others. And I was just like, fuck, it's so dystopian. Um, and not saying there's anything wrong with like casual hookups and everything, there's definitely not, but like Tinder and these apps have become like a very prominent way in which people date now. And it's just very, very hard for me to ever think about wanting to go compete in that environment. And like, I'm not a, like a bad looking guy or anything. I don't think I would have a problem getting some matches and stuff. But then for me personally, like it's two things. It's like, I wouldn't want to date someone just based on like, oh, I like you based on this app. But then I also would think it's a bad representation for people of what your personality is like. And I, I, I actually emotionally, I don't think like not, it would hurt me. Just, I could not have the emotional energy to go on multiple first dates and work out quickly. I really do not like this person. <laughs> Whereas like in the past in school, it's easy to do this. You become very good friends with someone and then you realize you you like a lot of them, like not just the looks. Um, so if I ever dated again, I'd probably only want to go out with a friend, a friend of a friend who like, I can kind of get to know in like that environment before dating them or just someone you meet somewhere else and maybe get to know somewhere else because that like day and also like sadly we're not not everyone is blessed with conventionally attractive looks and if you're one of these people who has to use tinder or everything like you might not get any matches uh which sucks like and it's and it means the people who are conventionally attractive or maybe not even sometimes attractive people who take, take a good photo like i'm not very photogenic um i can't smile on demand like i literally cannot sm i cannot do a natural smile on demand i'm photogenic in the sense i can I had nice photos taken of me in like natural settings. Um, but if you ask me, take some pictures of yourself for a dating website, they would not be good. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's just like a, a very dystopian thing. I know we've moved completely off topic with this one, but <laughs> I'm going to read some comments now. Um, Tinder is good for a quick moral boost. It's nice uh, for a match to have think of people thinking, well, I'm hot, but holding a conversation there is hard. Yeah, for sure. Um, change more stuff. Um, Tinder is good for casual sex. I mean, that's probably what it's, what it's best for.
best food that I know how to cook. I mean, I'm I can cook most things. I guess fajitas I always like. <laughs> Age of consent debate brewing in chat. To be honest, me and my girlfriend were actually talking about that before, and I won't say who said this, but there was a certain debate with a certain infamous YouTuber who reviewed cuties, and they were talking about what age people would naturally be attracted to men. And the people in the conversation said about 14 years old. And I said to my girlfriend, I think that's such a red flag because I think I think there is a certain underground element of men who are totally nonces. I think your average men, like generally, if you surveyed the whole male population, I'd say the ideal age of a woman in terms of looks for men, I'd say it'd be about 21 to 23 or maybe 22 to 25. I do not think most men are nonces, to be honest. I think it's a big red flag if people think <laughs> that is like the most popular uh, age group. If if there were no like morals and laws in society, that's what men would flock to. I really don't believe that at all. I think it would be like 21 to 25. Like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Some new visuals would be nice. I mean, I'm probably not going to be online for too much longer. There you go. There's my Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, like, age of consent is, like, just a bare minimum legal thing. It doesn't mean, like, I don't know. I'm 26. I think fucking 21-year-olds are, like, babies. Do you know what I mean? Like, I find it sick. Any, any. I've seen 26-year-olds going out of 18-year-olds. I think that is, is so gross. I know it was more normalized in old, older society. Um, but I think that's, I just can't get it. I, I just, I just don't, I don't have anything in common with 18-year-olds, right? I have 18-year-old cousins you can feel the generational difference and also they look fucking young as hell as you get older these people who even when you thought you were old when you were 18 they look like kids and i look at myself when i was 18 i'm like fucking and i and i'm so fucking different to how i was even when i was 21 and i'm like i find it so gross like there are like people who normalize this shit like we're talking about Leonardo DiCaprio going out of 21 year olds i think that's really gross uh, even fucking what's her name who plays um that character in Black Widow, Florence Pugh going out with Zach Braff. Oh, that is dirt. He's like 45 and she's 25. Oh, that is fucking gross, man. If I don't remember 9-11, there too. Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Calvin Ackle, I visit my sister whose daughter is 18. I have nothing to talk about like Jeffrey and Generations yet. My sister, my sister's, my sister's 20. And we can talk about things, but you, you can still feel the generation generational difference, and it's only six and a bit years. Yeah, um, Raphael, I feel that for sure. Like, even when I was like third year of university, which is only twenty twenty one, I would I would say the exact same thing. Any anyone, like anyone who obsesses about age of consent, or even thinks like most men would automatically go for those types like I, I think it's like a meme for libertarians which i get and i think it's a very very it is a massive problem like noncing and all this stuff is such a problem i still just don't think that most men see that as like the ideal thing that they would go for if there were no rules in society and morals and i think even like child marriage in in like olden times like a thousand years ago 1500 no 1500s and shit like that i think it, you still read a lot of stories where they aren't all like 12 years old or some shit like that. But yeah, I, I, the things like Leonardo DiCaprio, that's, it's just, it, it's, it's gross because it's a pattern as well. Like it's not even like he went out of a 21 year old and then he's going out with a 30 year old. It's like 21, 21, 21, 20, 21, 21. And it's just like, dude, like have some fucking shame, man. Like it's just so, perverted i guess in a weird way macron macron okay that's a bit different since she's such so actually how, how old was he when they started dating actually but yeah it is fucking weird <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, some nonce teacher as well. What, what wasn't that Republican lawmaker? Massive groomer and nonce. I should debate Mr. Girl about all this. <laughs> Vote for Macron, Adam, or something. Yeah, that guy. I only see that guy's YouTube community post, and he just seems like an idiot. My parents are ten years. Um, my parents are one year. Me and my girlfriend are three days apart. <laughs> I'm. We're both born in November, so we're both born in the same week, <laughs> which is cool. J Lord, thanks so much for the five bucks. Really appreciate that. Um, five Australian. Uh, some say that this Twitter takeover is part of the anti SJW resurgence online, and we'll go back to 2016. Do you agree? Uh, some say being Xander Hall, which Xander Hall or whatever the fuck his name is, which everyone always keeps posting in my comments. I don't think there's any anti SJW resurgence. Anti SJWs have fucking dominated since 2016. It's not a resurgence. Quartering, he wasn't around in 2016 in the form he is. Geeks and gamers, that was barely around. They're absolutely massive now. Um, you know, most of the conservative media like Ben Shapiro, they're playing into this anti SJW shit. I don't think there's any resurgence. They just continue to dominate. Like, it's always been this way. The only good thing is now on the platform, there isn't only a handful of left wing YouTubers, there's a lot of us, which is a good thing. Is that true about Macron? That is dirt, man. I never knew that. <laughs> All right, everyone, I'm really hungry. And I've just done this stream on top of going on a live stream. So I've been streaming for about nearly four hours. Um, I'm going to go now. Uh, thanks so much for the chat. Fun chat tonight. Uh, nice and lively. Enjoyed it. I was actually really fucking tired when we started. Um, and yeah, so thanks for keeping me entertained. I appreciate that. Um, tomorrow, new video about body image with uh, muscly women and the reaction to that. We're going to do something about the politics of Pornhub um, this week. And I need one more idea. I don't have any other ideas. So <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, guys. Um, thanks to Super Chats, people who gave me them. Really appreciate that. And I will hopefully stream on Thursday night as well. And my streams will hopefully be up on the Cavernacle Extra this week as well, if you missed yesterday's one or you missed most of today's one. And yeah, have a good rest of your week. Hopefully see people on Thursday and look out for my new videos uh, tomorrow. Anyway, thanks so much guys for tuning to the stream and see you guys uh, on the next one.